All right. Whew. Good afternoon. All right. It's good. Always good. Uh, thank you so much to all of you for taking time out of your uh, designated couple hours where you're required to be here to listen to me speak. Really appreciate it. Um, as we mentioned, I'm Carly Ayers. Uh, this is my current website. It's an open, editable Google Doc I made back in 2015. Uh, for most of my career, I've worked as a writer, uh, as mentioned, using language and interaction to engage people in new and interesting ways. And so, as such, this website is somewhat emblematic of that in the sense that, as a Google Doc, it happens to be the place where a lot of my work tends to take place. Um, but also, uh, it's interactive, and it's, it's also where I work. Um, and it's a space for others to come and engage and participate in that process uh, which is a theme in a lot of the work that I do. So aside from being a place where I might add recent projects or out of office notices, anyone else can also come and add suggestions, make some changes, a few edits. So it's seen quite a few iterations since then, uh, earning it the title of one of the 10 ugliest websites on the internet. Uh, was very, very, very pleased with that. Uh, in addition to being a writer and a strategist and any number of multi-hyphenate terms that uh, happen to fit the moment, uh, I'm also a newly minted member of the adjunct faculty here at Parsons, teaching a course called Methods and Practices over in the NPS program. Some of my students are here right now. Uh, in communication design, along with my partner, Sebastian Chen Spire. And in some ways, teaching feels a little it feels kind of inevitable. It feels like this process of codifying a lot of the work that I've been doing over the years, mainly discovering, amassing, and hoarding links and tools and resources, only now regurgitating them and explaining their contents and context in a slightly more digestible, linear 15-week format. Uh, I even have an ARENA channel, if all of you have used ARENA before, uh, that's entirely of resources for design job seekers. So uh, created after getting a lot of coffees with individuals who uh, had kind of similar set of questions, uh, usually uh, some recent design school graduates, perhaps like many of you here today. Uh, and the class we teach connects the dots between the skills and lessons gleaned as part of your contemporary design curriculum uh, with those, you need to interface with, you know, the rest of the world. Uh, sometimes that interface looks a bit like this. Uh, designer and author Frank Camaro uh, astutely observed that you could take any New Yorker cartoon, uh, and with that little caption at the bottom that you can swap out and replace with different things, add the term, hi, I'd like to add you to my professional network on LinkedIn. Uh, and it's, it's true, it holds up, it still holds up. Uh, if you've ever been unlucky enough to be on the receiving end of someone's first foray into professionalism, it's usually accompanied by a similar LinkedIn email blast to literally anyone they've ever emailed before. But a practice isn't simply made up of a series of LinkedIn blasts or bios or uh, portfolios or any number of those things organized in just such a way. Uh, it's more about the combination of those things, the gestalt, the organized whole picture, uh, more than the sum of its parts. But what makes up practice, and what is practice, or a practice? Uh, as I've been asked to come here today to try to dissect the different elements of my own practice, it's something I was ruminating on. Uh, this is a still from a movie called Patterson, where in a reverse universe, Adam Driver did not become a Jedi, and instead, he became a bus driver, as well as a poet by the name of Patterson. I saw it for the first time when I took a writing class at the School for Poetic Computation last year. Uh, and if you're not familiar with SFPC, it's not too far away. You can walk right over there. You should definitely check it out. Uh, Patterson lives in a town that's also called Patterson, no relation, and spends every free moment every break, every off hours, writing poems. But no one sees the poems. He doesn't share them. He writes them in this little notebook while he's sitting in this bus. Uh, and it begs the question that if you write poetry, and no one but you 
ever reads it? Are you still a poet? What if he only wrote one poem, like just one time? Maybe he shared it, maybe he didn't. What about two? Um, at what point does he kind of cross this threshold between uh, doing something and kind of becoming this practitioner, becoming a poet? I'm of the belief that if you do something more than once with the intention of doing the second time even just a little bit better than the first time, it's a practice. Practice is the things we do over and over and over again in hopes that uh, each time will be slightly better than the last. In our class, defining your practice starts with defining your values. In a world where caring about something genuinely and sincerely, uh, perhaps articulating that in a public forum of sorts, uh, having a set of values is an increasingly vulnerable act. And it's something that can be really, really hard. But it's the underlying belief system that guides your goals, your ambitions, your objectives, the type of work you want to do more of or less of. And it can also serve as a litmus test for evaluating future work, opportunities. And there's no wrong answer. I mean, they're your values. So can't be wrong. We make this list of values, and then we extrapolate on them. Uh, we turn them into actionable tenets that you can use and apply as the foundation of your own practice. For me, this is an annual exercise that started several years ago, uh, back when I met a few collaborators while working at Google's Creative Lab. And we got together and set out to build the design studio called Haraf. Together, we made a list of these things, values and rules, for what we wanted to test out in starting a studio like to always start with concept. So concept is number one. Uh, always tell the truth. Uh, I'm laughing because I see do not pander to the bureaucracy. We were, uh, we're really fighting it. Um, concept, of course, uh, to always start with that. Never do something because that's the way it's been done before. To listen and to always tell the truth, as well as to always be learning. Learning is important. Every year we would get together and we would reevaluate this list. We'd talk about what was working, what wasn't, uh, make changes, amendments to make sure that we were continuing to grow and evolve in all the ways that we wanted to. Uh, this was a more finite, condensed list from a few years into the studio. And the studio itself was a recursive exercise in learning by doing. Could we do the work we wanted to do and make money? Could we juggle getting the work and doing the work? learn how to shape proposals and projects, and also share what we learned along the way, ideally without getting fired by any of our clients. The answers to most of those questions was yes. Uh, and after learning those things, we decided to shut the studio down last March. We even made the graphics for it. And now a year after having closed the studio, I've been reevaluating what that list looks like for me. So what are the tenets of my own practice? How do I approach my work? What do I want the output of that work to be? So I was grateful for this opportunity to come here today and to think about that, both uh, in this class that we've been teaching here at Parsons, but also to now dig a bit deeper and share some of those tenets with all of you today. So I got my start studying industrial design. Has anyone read this book? Anyone? Anyone? No? Uh, this is Design for the Real World uh, by Victor Papanek, otherwise known as why the things you buy are expensive, badly designed, unsafe, and usually don't work. With some startling practical alternatives, like a ratio that costs nine cents, an S6 refrigerator, a television set for $8, and much, much more. Um, but I think it was somewhere in my junior year of studying industrial design that I decided I didn't want to be an industrial designer. It just didn't feel, didn't feel right for me. Uh, don't get me wrong, I love stuff. Uh, I'll show you some of the stuff I love a little further on. Uh, and if you come over to my apartment and see my hoarder's den of stuff, I have a lot of stuff. Um, but I didn't really want to make any more stuff. It seems like there was a lot of stuff out there already. Uh, it was somewhere between learning the components that make up an iPhone or a classmate's design of a pivoting uh, power outlet that I felt a little bit like maybe I didn't need to make more stuff. I carved a wooden disc. Whew, you missed that, but that was a futuristic spatula. Uh, I also hammered out a laser cut bowl and a foldable birdhouse. 
which never, never quite made it to market. I took woodworking, metal smithing. And while I love making things, and I still do, uh, something about industrial design, it just didn't look right on me. Didn't, didn't totally click. Look at that face. I made lots of other things that I did like, uh, some of which I still have today. Very useful coat rack, great. But I would always find myself kind of deviating from the rules, uh, doing something else entirely. When my class was told to create a model of many layers as part of an entire structure, uh, I 3D modeled a sandwich or vacuum formed some bread. I did this thing involving 3D printed letters that I made into wallpapers. A reading machine. You'd cut up the book and you'd put it in and it would spray it into your face from a hairdryer. <laughs> Very clever. But what I did more than anything else uh, was talk. I talk a lot, if you know me, I'm a very talkative person. But I would mostly talk to my classmates about the things that they were making. Uh, I think my most on-brand, like Carly Ayers trademark story, is that I would make press releases for my classmates. Like Jamie Wolfund and his frumpy chairs, pictured here, uh, I would help them tell the story about their work. I really liked that exercise of translating what it was they were doing, what made that work meaningful to them, why they were doing it, and then figuring out the best way to share that with other people. It was almost a game to me to see how many of my classmates I could get on like different blogs, out in the open, get them doing things like this, speaking at conferences, uh, and trying to see which of their stories resonated most. And it's something I kept doing with the studio as well. For every project we would do, we'd make a press release, ship it out to different blogs. Uh, and we also then made guidelines so other people could do that too. Perhaps very naturally then, uh, writing press releases for my friends and classmates turned into writing articles. Uh, it led to me starting a blog where I'd write the whole story. Uh, when I joined the industrial design department at RISD, see, if you had Googled RISD industrial design, the number one search result would be this, uh, this forum post on Core 77 telling you why you should never hire a RISD industrial design student. I thought that was a bit of a problem. Uh, especially if I wanted a job after I graduated. So uh, a few enterprising students and myself set about starting the very first RISD industrial design blog uh, where we would interview other students, faculty and alumni, all about their work, focusing on ideally upping the SEO enough that we could bump that forum post out of the thread. And it worked. Sure enough, RISDID.org became the first thing you would find when Googling RISD industrial design, even beyond our own school's website, which not surprising when you know our history of uh, digital design. Not only did the blog replace that forum post, but it got me on the radar of a writer at Core 77, coincidentally enough, uh, who invited me to cover events happening on campus, which kind of led to everything else. Writing for Core 77 gave me this ability to reach out to designers and creators, people who I admired, who were already practicing their work out in the wild, and gave me an excuse to talk to them and uh, write about the work that they were doing. Which takes me to one of my first tenets. Everything is relationships. I'm a big believer that life is about the people you meet, the things you discuss, the ideas, and that, that leads to literally everything else. When I look back through the decisions that have led to where I am today, every single one of them comes down to some person, some conversation, a relationship, or a community who believed in me and trusted me to do something. They took risks on me and they invested in me. So shortly after that existential crisis, my junior year, I sent an email to Tina Roth Eisenberg, who goes by the nom de net of Swiss Miss, uh, she's the founder of Creative Mornings, an international lecture series. They had an event today. Yuri went to it, um, which landed me an internship. And that internship led to a full-time job as their second employee after graduation, helping them grow from 10 to 100 chapters. Last I checked, they're now at 215. Not so bad. And to drill that tenant even deeper, a few of those chapter organizers have then gone on to become some of our very first studio clients. 
So working with people in San Francisco and Atlanta, all across the US and internationally, which goes to say, find your people. But more importantly, bring them together. Tina used to also share this Seth Godin quote that said, who you hang out with determines what you dream about and what you collide with. And the collisions and the dreams lead to your changes. And the changes are what you become. Change the outcome by changing your circle. Everyone in this room probably has some sort of a circle. Maybe it's a circle of classmates, a circle of a community of people you found upon moving to New York. And those are the people who are influencing your thoughts, your ideas, the types of books you read. And the moment you start to make changes with that, maybe going to an event you hadn't been to previously or uh, meeting a new group, that's like when those ideas start to change and shift. After leaving Creative Mornings, I had this unexpectedly short stint at a branding agency that pushed me headfirst into freelancing. Simultaneously, because of my experience at Creative Mornings, uh, I was already this conduit between a lot of different members of that community and was always being asked to make introductions, help someone find a designer, help a designer find a role, et cetera, and so forth. Uh, I knew it wasn't super sustainable for me to uh, individually be connecting all these disconnected dots. Uh, so I wanted to find a way to do that more easily. Ideally, put all the dots in the same place. Maybe they could then all just connect with each other. Selfishly, I also hoped it would re reduce the number of DMs or emails that I was getting. Uh, but it ended up kind of doing the opposite. So Hundreds Under 100 was born out of that idea, uh, now called Hundreds or Hundos. Uh, mostly because at the time I was still nursing the wound of, uh, I believe, being rejected from ADC Young Guns for the second or third time. So play on any number of awards given to a select few under a certain age range. Hundreds under 100s was meant to be the antithesis. Inclusive and inviting, everyone was welcome. It was intended to be a space for freelancers and other creative folks to share work, get advice, all within this safe environment, providing an alternative to say, I don't know, tweeting about asking how much I should be charging my clients, knowing very well that most of my clients were probably already following me. Uh, now nose deep in freelancing, I also wanted to pool the hive mind of those who had come before me. I was not the first freelancer. I wouldn't be the last freelancer. And I knew that a lot of people out there already had that knowledge. Uh, and I wanted to find a way that we could all be sharing it and helping each other along the way. So what started as a Slack group, because that was the cool new enterprise software at the moment, uh, Hundos began with just a few channels. We had intros, we had help, jobs, show and tell, link pack. Uh, now there's over 100 channels. Um, and then I also brought on a group of admins, and together we pulled together our own code of conduct. Uh, we forked it from a few other communities, making changes and amendments as necessary to suit our needs. And it's even seen a lot of iterations since then. Uh, we quickly learned that what you permit, you promote. So to nip bad shit in the bud, early and often. We have a no tolerance policy when it comes to any accusations of sexual harassment, assault, racism, or otherwise. Uh, and we've learned a lot along the way. Like there's this inherent flaw to the idea that everyone is welcome. Everyone can't be welcome. You can't welcome everyone. Some people really suck. You don't want to welcome them. And if everyone is welcome, then no one is. You have to be able to exclude to include. Uh, this is a snippet from a book I read recently, The Art of Gathering, uh, where they talk about a Bar Barack Obama's aunt. Uh, if everyone is invited, no one is invited. Uh, by closing the door, you're able to create the room which is a difficult line to walk, because you want to include everyone. The community itself is also incredible at creating these shared documents and resources that surface the collective wisdom of the group all in one place. So say a conversation really takes off around different resources for printing in New York City, someone will collect those, they'll add them to the shared Google Doc uh, and share it around. Volunteers help moderate and update those docs with plans to share more resources over the next year. And sharing happens in person as well. We do this event series called Show and Tell, uh, which was an effort to kind of get people out of the Slack and into the real world, where people come together and share those lessons in person. Which takes me to another tenet, share what you know. 
It's no coincidence that when members are added to the Slack, they're added to the help channel by default. The understanding is that offering and receiving help is part of being part of this community. You have to give to get. That knowledge, that value exchange is key. Again, I believe deeply in the power of relationships that work together to create a community and our shared responsibility in supporting and lifting each other up. It's something we tried to bring into the studio as well. At HARF, we'd share what we know by opening ourselves up to questions via Instagram and email, inspiring a series that we hosted every month at our studio where anyone could sign up and come ask us anything. Not only did it help combine 10 coffee conversations into one, but the best insights usually came from the people who attended these events. Frequently, they would answer each other's questions, connect each other to opportunities, uh, and bring a host of diverse perspectives and experiences that made the conversations just infinitely better. We'd also share what we knew by showing our profit and loss statements at different conferences that we spoke at, or writing about our client intake process for the creative independent. This guide starts with understanding your value, again, something that's kind of important to me, uh, and finishes with how to know when it's time for you to walk away from a potential collaboration or a relationship. Uh, and it has our entire approach to new business, even including a few email templates to make it really easy to plug and play. We also shared this flowchart, uh, which includes our decision-making process for what types of projects we should take on, uh, which includes a section uh, where we ask ourselves, are we broke? It's important. Sometimes you have to ask yourself, yes, no. Are we like really, really broke? Are we going to feel OK and be willing to talk about this? If the answer to that is no, then we wouldn't do it. It's that simple. We believe that if we couldn't afford to keep our doors open without doing work that we weren't willing to talk openly about, then we probably shouldn't be running a studio. And part of our announcement that we were shutting down the studio, we also shared a link to our Google Drive folder with various templates, tools, all the things that we used and created over the course of running HARF. In starting the studio, we were really interested in learning how to run a studio. That was the exercise. So in shutting it down, we wanted to share what we learned in hopes that other people might uh, learn something if they were just starting out themselves. And through all of this, I also learned that when you invite people into your process, they tend to care a lot more about the end result. Maybe they'll even write you an email saying they're sad the studio shut down, or a Medium post where they, where they uh, you know, get the little tombstone out there, let you know. But for us, the decision to shut down the studio was always rooted in growth, which is another tenet, always be growing. That was always the metric. Uh, it was even built into that flowchart I showed just now about which projects that you should take on. Here's a tried and true and uh, infinitely much simpler flowchart that I occasionally refer to over the years to help me decide whether I should keep doing something or whether I should go and do something else. It's pretty straightforward. And for me, learning happens most often by doing. I think everyone in the studio also shared that same curiosity and willingness to learn by trying things out. We did that through projects like live streaming the process of developing our own process. We've all read one of these articles. Um, they promised to disclose the creativity secret or the strategies for making magic. Fun. Uh, and it's this framing and our complicity in that that not only does our entire industry a disservice by kind of depicting the work we do as something akin to magic, but it also kind of perpetuates this idea that there's some sort of secret, secret toolkit you need to be like a capital D designer. It positions the work we do as something that is ephemeral, intangible, and makes it difficult to advocate for its value. So with the studio, we really wanted to demystify the process of a young studio developing their own practice. We also wanted to learn how to live stream, which was very cool at the time. Um, we're doing it right now. Uh, which we figured out how to do in a few different ways, one of which include duct taping an iPad to the ceiling of the new museum. Uh, in an attempt to do that, we responded to 26 briefs over 26 hours, one for every hour, one for every letter of the alphabet, and one hour for every letter. Uh, we built this generator, which pulls words and their definitions from the dictionary, according to each letter. Each hour, we would click a letter, boop. 
would give us a definition, and we would make something in real time, and people could follow along online. For us, this was an exercise in trying out a lot of different ways of working together, uh, albeit under extreme circumstances, but in a way that we could better figure out how we came up with good ideas as a group. At the end of every hour, we would document the highs and the lows, upload what we made, so that we could try to do better the next time. Live streaming also allowed us to make a ton of new friends, uh, including Shelly, who joined us from Australia just as we were waning in our motivation, I think around 2 a.m. was the perfect pep talk we needed to make it all the way through. And we made a lot. Uh, we made a lot of arguably useless things, uh, from a dink bar, which is kind of a kind bar, music, music video, typeface. But oddly enough, a lot of those projects where at face value they seem to be kind of useless, ended up uh, being turned into real projects, like this one we did for LA-based fashion brand, Entire World, uh, this voyeuristic e-commerce experience where we used a lot of live streaming, uh, or this custom typeface we did for artist Mark Horowitz that's made out of Mark. We also did this website where you could call and hear Mark charismatically narrate you through his work. We did another one for artist Taeyun Choi, one of the co-founders of the aforementioned SFPC, uh, which reimagined formats of reading his book, Poetic Computation, or even our own website where you can play tic-tac-toe with a bot, you could draw us an email, I think you still can, as well as a few other things. But for us, it was all about growth. We didn't want to repeat projects, which uh, double-edged sort of is the best way to make more money is by doing the same thing over and over and over again. But we didn't want to do that. And now I'm a little bit in sponge mode. This is uh, a phase where I want to learn everything. I'm actually more like scrub daddy mode. This is how I think of myself. So far in 2020, I've read seven books. I've taken, taken classes in coding and cooking, oral history. I'm learning sign language uh, and taking acting classes. Doing it all which may seem like an odd assortment of things, uh, but they're all kind of related, and I'm not really interested in becoming particularly good at any one thing. I had a furniture teacher when I was at RISD who used to say, if you want to design a chair, don't look at other chairs. Just don't. I'm interested in meaningful relationships, encouraging interaction, building communities. I don't want to go to a networking seminar I want to learn how to tell stories, to communicate better with others, and immerse myself in literally anything else. But speaking of chairs, this is one I really like. It's by Enzo Mari. I've been on a little Enzo Mari kick lately. Here he is assembling one of those said chairs. Uh, it's from a concept he had where you would build simple pieces of furniture, 19 to be exact, using only common dimensional lumber, fastened with nails, no cuts or joinery or additional finishes, kind of just hammering this thing together in your living room, which is actually something that I did recently. If you're not familiar with Enzo, he's an Italian artist, furniture designer. He also liked to dabble in a lot of other fields. He was always doing a mix of things, uh, like this fable game, which came out in 1965. It's kind of a book, but it's not really a book. It's not really a book to be read or leafed through. It's kind of one that you make up yourself. You piece these different cards together to tell your own stories. You unmake it, you build it up, and then you break it back down again. You combine the cards in whatever format that tickles your fancy to tell the story that you're trying to tell. That's what it looks like. Or his uh, animali and pesky jigsaw puzzles, which are each made up of 16 different animals. This one includes 12 fish, three mammals, a mollusk. Kind of fun. Yeah. Uh, and of course, the accompanying woodblock printed book using those same characters. Which takes me back to where we started uh, in amassing and hoarding objects. As I mentioned, I have this tendency to collect and organize links, resources, many of which can be found over in Arena, others in Airtable spreadsheets, more in Drive folders and Google Docs. But my recent peaked interest in Enzo has brought a few new items into my collection. This is my current eBay search query. 
you know, just keeping an eye out, looking out for little objects. I love learning about these various artifacts, tracing their lineage, and then patiently just waiting for them to appear. Sometimes through scanning other people's scans that they upload, I can learn more about this stuff, find something else that I'm interested in, and go from there. And every now and then, I do find one for a reasonable price point, bring it home with me. It's led to a slight accumulation of books. Got a lot of books right now. When I travel, sometimes finding something that I like there. You know, a little hamburger stool. This is a glass I bought. It's a little character, Mexico. I've come to realize that I'm a bit of a maximalist. I've gone through phases where I've tried to streamline my wardrobe, have a work uniform, uh, which was an all black shirt dress I would wear different variations of every day, kind of like Doug Funny with the closet where all the clothes look the same. Tried to make myself smaller, practice face neutrality, something that I've, I've heard recently, or be a generally more quiet and agreeable person. But I found it's, it's really just not in my nature. It's not. Uh, I was actually in this auditorium only a few weeks ago uh, when my friend Adam J. Kurtz gave an incredible pep talk on creativity and personal work. This is a slide from that. Uh, and he so kindly reminded me and everyone else who is fortunate enough to be sitting where you're sitting right now that this is kind of it. All you have right now is uh, what you have. But that's kind of a really, really good thing because no one else has that and no one else can be the person that you are. No one else has these experiences, this perspective, your values. Life is an exercise of figuring out who you are and then becoming that person. Sounds like something that's woven on a pillow somewhere. Um, but the more I can learn to lean into the more, uh, the closer I feel like I'm getting to that. Uh, all you have is what you have, and you leverage those things to do the things you want to do. That was something we said a lot when we ran the studio. Someone else once told me that everything you do is like a pancake kind of odd. He said, you know what I mean? And I was like, no, I, I actually have no idea what you're talking about. Um, and he was like, well, the first one is usually, you know, not, not very good. The first pancake usually always sucks. But they do get better over time. And the only way to make better pancakes is by making more pancakes. Kind of once you make one, then the pan gets all nice and oily, you add another one, etc. You just do it over and over and over again. And soon enough, you have a nice fat stack of pancakes. But perhaps more importantly, making does kind of work that way too. It leads to more making. The more stuff you're doing, the more inputs you're getting, it just leads to more things. The more conversations you have, the more relationships, the easier it gets. Soon you are a pancake expert. And next up are crepes or some other seemingly complicated breakfast food. But all you can do is your best. And it's usually in your best interest to assume that everyone else is doing theirs too. And while right now it may feel like this poster I made many, many ages ago, there's little Carly hanging up that poster, there's hope because people do keep making things. Um, more pancakes. My pal Sean Suchara and his collaborator Fanny Lore have this wonderful semi-regular newsletter called But What Can I Do? Encouraging people to find their voice through sustainability and community. I have another friend, Cameron Koskon, who makes this wonderful, wonderful, absolutely delightful intermittent recap on YouTube of all the wonderful things people are making out in the world. This slide's just to say, say hello to someone. Find someone you don't know. You all go to school together, so you might already know each other. But to me, if you can get anything out of being put in this room together, hopefully you can meet someone forge a new relationship, apply that to something new in your life. It's a lifelong practice. I showed this uh, career asymptote that I uh, have invented, trying to get patented. I really think it's going to go somewhere. Uh, to my class, I think the first or second class. Uh, and it's this idea that you have these things you want to do and the things that people pay you to do. There's usually two opposing things on either side forever and ever. And it just spins around, and it always gets closer with each thing you do, each new role you take, each job, everything you make. 
you kind of oscillate between those two polarities and you get closer and closer, but you never actually, you can never get quite there. But that's the exercise, it's kind of just moving back and forth, doing it over and over and over again. So these are the things that I've been practicing. Thank you for letting me share those with all of you here today. Everyone likes to see this slide where there's like some numbers and some words on it. They like to take pictures of it. So I always try to include one of these at the end of my talks. Thanks. So, that's good.